Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the October 17th, 2024 Las Vegas Stadium Authority Board meeting. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, welcome to the members of the board, uh, both uh, here in person and online. Thank you for being here as well. Um, we will call the meeting to order and I'll turn it over to Ms. Bateman to take a roll call. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board. All members are present either in person or virtually other than members uh, Vias, White, and Diaz. You do have a quorum and the meeting may proceed. Thank you very much. Um, we will open our first uh, public comment uh, period. Uh, the first uh, public comment period is limited to comments uh, on uh, items on the agenda. Um, please identify yourself and limit comments to three minutes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Uh, Jeremy Koo, KOO. Um, I have comments on two items, seven and 12. Um, concerning item seven, the draft lease, um, I'm first, I'm looking forward to the answer, Chair Hill uh, promised to the question I posed at the July 18th meeting uh, about whether the, the A's and Raiders Stadco's would have to pay a uh, low eight figure annual uh, leasehold tax for leasing property from an entity that is exempt from uh, real property tax. Uh, in the meantime, I have submitted a petition for an advisory opinion to the Department of Taxation about this question, and if they follow their own rules, they should respond by November 12th. Uh, I have copied authority staff and others with an interest in this question, and I will submit this afternoon a copy of the petition suitable for inclusion in the minutes. Uh, with respect to item 11, um, the, what should be a, a draft deed, um, I'm concerned that to this point that there haven't been there hasn't been any discussion about either the A's or the or this board reaching an agreement with GLPI uh, to record a negative easement to protect the strip views out the big window that has been featured in the uh, the various drawings. Um, if you compare the height levels of the Bally's master plan preview that was submitted to County Comprehensive Planning this week uh, to the A's plans that were submitted at the same time, uh, you can see that the meeting space and terrace area that will be visi visible out the left side of that window uh, will exceed the main concourse height by about 18 and a half feet. Um, if you draw a line from the behind home plate view to the left side of the window uh, where the, the Bally's phase one ballroom and terrace space will be, uh, it seems like you lose the uh, bottom half of the, uh, the Statue of Liberty and a bit more to the right of that. Um, and so I would encourage this board to think of what makes iconic ballparks iconic, that view out from home plate. Think PNC Park and the Pittsburgh skyline and the Roberto Clemente Bridge, uh, Petco Park and the Western Metal Supply Warehouse and the San Diego skyline, Camden Yards and the B&O warehouse, and the list goes on and on. Uh, as a fan of an Oakland team whose own ballpark lost its spectacular view of the East Bay Hills and the more intimate bleachers of that era, when the LA Raiders returned to Oakland, I speak from personal experience. It turned that view out from home plate into an eyesore for the sake of additional seats that themselves did not have a very good view for both football and baseball. So I can tell you that these views will be important to the locals and to the tourists. They are as integral to the ballpark as the nine acres that the ballpark sits on. And Cherry Hill indicated as such when he told the Senate in the special session that the stadium will have a view of the strip, strip that cannot be be beaten. In March, architect Bjark Engels said a giant window frames a majestic view of the life of the strip. All direct sunlight is blocked while all the soft daylight is allowed to wash the field in natural light. And the Nevada Independent paraphrases John Fisher saying in March, whatever Bally's decides to build will not be in front of the large window blocking views of the strip. So to conclude, this board should ensure that by the time it takes over ownership of the land, that it can enforce this vision and these assurances going forward with a written recorded height limit on the property out that window. Thank you. Good afternoon. Afternoon, Alexander Marshall of Schools Over Stadiums. Well, after 16 months since a special session, it appears that public education is not the only thing suffering from a lack of public and financial investment. It's ironic, when public education receives additional funding, it comes with layers of accountability. Yet when billionaires get their hands on public money, they're met with cheerleaders and excuses, mainly from this chair and the Review Journal. Where is the accountability for this misguided project? You'll try and build this stadium on the, on the backs of educators and the majority of our community who do oppose this stadium deal, but here's why it matters. Next legislative session, we'll need an additional $600 million to keep on the path for public education national average. We're hearing that amount's unlikely, which means that we'll then need a $1.5 billion investment in 2027. 
And if that number sounds familiar, that's the current estimated cost of this stadium. You are building a $1.5 billion stadium that costs the exact same amount as getting our public education to the national average. We know that this publicly financed stadium won't solve any of our financial woes because the first publicly financed stadium didn't solve our woes. That's why we show up to these meetings. We understand you've been provided a task by our misguided legislature, that, and, but that task does not include gaslighting our community. That task does not include cheerleading for an inept billionaire. That task does not include bending over backwards in the face of all economic data. There is a reason baseball doesn't have cheerleaders. Someone has to point out what an absolute waste of public resources this is, and we're happy to be those happy warriors and the one consistent organization pointing out the absolute failure of our elected officials and our appointed leaders when it comes to being good stewards of our public money. This chair, who was lobbying for this bill and now oversees the implementation somehow, proved our point best in his recent comments. It's clear the Fishers have the ability to provide the financing for the stadium, period. They just have it. Thank you for proving our point. If they have the money, why can't the billionaire pay for the stadium himself without relying on public funds? Why are we here when every economist and our educators are waiting in the cheap seats to tell you all we told you so? We're happy to be watchdogs on this issue. Um, we understand that uh, the, the court didn't rule on the constitutionality of our issue because they noted that the case wasn't ripe after 16 months and very little work having been accomplished to trigger any public funding. We'll be ready and wait when it does, because this is a fight worth having. Public money doesn't belong in these kinds of projects, and we'll continue to educate our community on this issue, which has led to the public overwhelmingly disapproving of this misguided project. Those numbers will continue to rise as demand for actual changes we face is demanded of you all. When we get this on the ballot, our citizens will finally have a voice. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, seeing none, uh, we will move on to the approval of the agenda and minutes. Um, I will note that uh, we are going to remove uh, agenda item 11, which relates to the deed from this meeting. Um, as the board knows, but others may not, um, we are going to call a special meeting uh, of the board to address uh, the deed issue on October 31st at 9.30, uh, both here and online. Um, and we will address the, the deed issue um, at that meeting. We want to make sure that um, the public, the media, everybody that has an interest in this document um, that we will need moving forward um, has an ample opportunity to see it, uh, provide comments uh, between the meeting on October 31st and uh, December 5th. Um, it, um, simply is a document that is, it does involve GLPI as well as ballets and the A's and the stadium authority. I uh, wasn't quite ready for this meeting, so we will have a, uh, um, a special meeting on October 31st in order to deal with that agenda item. Um, other than that, uh, if anybody uh, has any changes uh, that they would like to recommend to the agenda, you're welcome to do so. If not, I would entertain a motion to approve. Got a, got a motion and we have a second? Second. Got a motion. Second. All in favor or actually please cast your votes. Aye. This is Lawrence Epstein. Yeah, aye as well. I uh, missed my window to vote apparently. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks very much. That that uh, passes. Hi, I'm um, Kenny James. Uh, I did not include the minutes in that motion. So uh, if there is a uh, motion to approve the minutes, I would accept that as well. A motion, do we have a second? Second. Got a motion and a second. Um, please cast your votes. Aye, Lawrence Epstein. Okay. Um, that passes as well. Thank you, everybody. I'm um, Kenny James. Thank you. Um, a number of comments uh, that I'd like to make today on a variety of different subjects. Just a few uh, pieces of news that I wanted to, um, you know, just put a spotlight on that I think are uh, um, worth highlighting. Um, the um, 
The NFL recognized uh, the Raiders um, about a month ago um, for their treatment of uh, players post-career. Uh, Troy Vincent, uh, who is in charge of uh, topics along those lines for the NFL, um, talked about this, made that recognition. Um, didn't get a lot of press, but I think it should. Uh, you know, the Raiders have um, a, a mantra and a value of uh, once a Raider, always a Raider. Uh, they treat uh, their players uh, following their career playing for the team uh, exceptionally well. Troy said that this should be a model and they intend to make it a model uh, for the NFL. So I just wanted to congratulate the, uh, the Raiders, thank the Raiders for um, representing the city so well in, in that area. Um, uh, Sports Business Journal uh, named uh, two women uh, game changers, uh, two of 50 uh, across the country. Uh, Emily Prazer from Formula One, who many of us know and work with on a regular basis, was one. Uh, and Chiava Martinez, who is the uh, chief sales officer for the Raiders, is another. Uh, so just wanted to um, congratulate both, both of them for that very significant honor. Um, and as we reported and has been reported, but we reported at our board meeting uh, last week, um, there is uh, an organization called Women of Inspiration in Sports and Events. Um, they have 24 chapters throughout the United States, including one in Las Vegas. And they have recognized um, women of inspiration, and there'll be a dinner in their honor here in just a couple of weeks. Um, Sandra Douglas Morgan uh, was uh, recognized. The Las Vegas Aces were recognized. Um, Lisa Motley with the LVCVA was recognized, and our own Jan Jones Blackhurst uh, was recognized as well. So I um, want to congratulate uh, Jan and everybody uh, for being inspirational. You truly are. Yeah, thank you. Um, we will get a note out uh, to this effect, but I uh, wanted to let the board know that uh, we will we will go back to quarterly meetings in 2025. Um, the dates, um, if you've got a pen, you'll know right now, we, we will send this out to all of you. Um, but the dates are February 20th, uh, May 22nd, August 21st, and November 20th of next year. Um, we may, um, have um, a need for special meetings between those quarterly meetings, but um, we'll do what we can to con con confine uh, the work of the stadium authority to those quarterly meetings. As we get into a construction process, uh, there certainly may be times where it just we just can't wait until um, the next quarterly meeting in order to conduct the business that we need to conduct. So we'll let you know as that as we go along with that. Um, couple of other points um, that um, at some level relate to the documents today, some relate to um, what we will need to do when we come back on December 5th to approve those documents. Um, I talked a little bit about uh, the financial capabilities of the A's. Um, we were able to um, review quite a bit of information uh, that was provided uh, by third parties, uh, largely, um, whether that was accounting firms or financial firms uh, that um, backed uh, the information uh, on the uh, Fisher's balance sheets. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to do that. Um, Section 22 of um, the law that was passed in June of last year says that the board must select a developer partner of one or more persons who have, and this is number three um, of what we need to do. We've done one and two already. Uh, but number three is demonstrated to the satisfaction of the board that the developer partner is able to successfully develop and construct the Major League Baseball Stadium project. And four, uh, provide to the board adequate financial security for the performance of the final financial obligations of a developer partner for the development. Um, we will need to make those findings uh, prior to uh, approving uh, the agreements that Mr. Finger is going to go through uh, here today. Um, so at the de December 5th meeting, um, we will approve the lease, we will approve the development agreement, we will approve the non-relocation agreement. Um, we will have a conversation and start a conversation with the board uh, around the Baseball Stadium Community Oversight um, Committee. Um, 
and we will also talk about the uh, the financing of Allegiant Stadium. Um, there will there will be a second uh, requirement um, in order uh, to allow the stadium authority to request bonding uh, by the county uh, that requires the team um, to set aside in the hands of third parties in irrevocable cash letters of credit or construction financing that provides all of the financing necessary uh, to construct the stadium. So that'll be a second step that will happen um, sometime probably in 2025, but prior uh, to issuance of uh, bonds by the county. Um, one other comment, uh, and that Mr. Finger, I'm sure we'll talk about this as well. Uh, in the lease document that you have today, there is one topic that's come up. Um, it's actually pretty easily um, identifiable as an example uh, in Jacksonville. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the news recently uh, in Jack Jacksonville is going to rehabil rehabilitate their football stadium uh, in their city. And in order to do the significant amount of rehabilitation uh, that is necessary, it's going to span through a football season and the Jaguars are going to have to relocate, not play in the stadium for that particular year, allow that rehabilitation to happen and then move back in for an extended period of time. Um, th that topic came up uh, several weeks ago. Uh, we intend to write language around that to allow that same type of thing to happen later in the lease. Um, as has been pointed out, this is an iconic location for a stadium. We want to make it last as long as possible. It is likely that in order to allow it to last for 40 or 50 or 60 years, there's going to come a time where there's going to need to be some significant work done to that stadium. Right now, the way the non-relocation agreement is written in the first 30 years, and this won't be changed, but um, at least after that, we'll have the same type of requirement that the team stay in that park and play their games. Um, we want to allow the opportunity um, for uh, the maintenance of the facility um, in a significant way that allows them to um, take a time out from playing in the stadium so that they can extend the time that they play in the stadium. So we don't have language for that today. That is probably the one substantive issue um, that I am aware of that we don't have language uh, for these documents. We will get that out, let you take a look at it, but wanted you to know that that topic uh, had come up. Um, and then finally, I don't know, Sandy, if you have um, uh, the opportunity to step up, talk a little bit about um, where you are in the development process, um, I think that would probably be of interest to the board and welcome this afternoon. Thanks for being here. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks so much. Uh, I'm Sandy Dean with the A's and the Fisher family. And um, I'll just say uh, thanks for the chance to talk and also to each of the board members for your engagement in what's been a now a year long process. It's um, uh, something for us to be here with our four required documents almost in final form. And also thanks to Steve and Ed and Caroline especially and also uh, Mark and Ryan for all their work on the documents as well. The uh, the news yesterday uh, is a good opportunity for us to update people on what's been happening on the planning and entitlement process. And um, uh, both the A's and uh, Bally's and GLPI together submitted um, a preliminary entitlement information to the county on Monday afternoon. And um, that, that for our respective projects, the A's for the ballpark, Bally's GLPI for their planned casino resort. And that information came public yesterday afternoon, I think pretty much in totality. And um, uh, the, the most significant uh, piece of that information, I think, is um, the A's and Bally's and GLPI have come to an agreement on a master plan for the site that that um, accommodates both the ballpark and a planned uh, casino resort in a way that we think, we each think is really good for our respective projects. Um, uh, the plans are preliminary 
end. Like this is our very first submission to the county. It was made on a preliminary basis and will need extensive re review by the county and also a number of other stakeholders. And that'll be a process that, that is now beginning. Um, the county review process will provide for public meetings and also input. So there'll be an opportunity for dialogue. Um, we're excited that the master plan has the ballpark in a location that um, uh, has a good view of the Las Vegas Strip and appreciate Mr. Koo talking about that. That's always been really important to us is to try and make sure that the ballpark has a view out of some of what is the best of what people think of when they think of the strip. It also has a significant Northwest Plaza for gathering outside of our uh, outfield cable wire uh, glass wall. And um, it also provides for meaningful um, on-site ballpark parking in the southeast corner of the of the parcel. Um, we'll, we will be able to say more about uh, the proposed plans once the county has had some opportunity to give input and we can have that be reflected in, in um, our next submission and th this will probably be an iterative process. Um, but, but the preliminary entitlement submission is an important step forward in the project. Um, and we're, we're really pleased to have made it and appreciate the partnership with Bowers and GLPI to help us get there as well. Um, thanks for the chance to give that update. Yeah, thank you, Sandy. We appreciate it. Um, okay, does anybody from the board have uh, any comments they'd like to make? Okay, uh, hearing none, I will um, turn this over to Mr. Finger. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, board. Agenda item one is a presentation about the flow of revenue to be used as the, for the Major League Baseball project. This is similar to the football flow of funds I showed you earlier in the year. The public contribution to the baseball stadium will come from county bonds, state transferable tax credits, and a county development credit. The county bonds and some of the state transferable tax credits will be repaid through a sports and entertainment improvement district, district which I will call the SEID going forward. That is within the footprint of the ballpark. The SEID requires the pledge of the taxes and fees generated inside of the SEID to pay for the baseball stadium project. And these taxes and fees include these listed on this slide. I uh, put certain ones in green because frankly, from a modeling perspective, that's the majority of the revenue source related to pay back uh, these purposes. The law prescribes the allowed uses and prescribes the order of uses for the SEID revenues. These are prescribed for both the period before bond issuance as well as the period after bond issuance. So let's start with the period of time before the bond issuance. The SEID revenues are either collected by or remitted to the county treasurer. County Treasurer then uses those revenues to pay for any required bond payments and to fund a reserve fund. And I'll mention this reserve fund several times to this presentation because there's points of uh, it can be paid. Uh, like the football one, it's required to be funded at two times the annual debt service amount, two times the annual bond payment amount. The revenue is then transferred to the baseball stadium tax account. That's the point it makes it to the authority. And this is the subject of agenda item two today. Stadium Authority has to use the SCID revenues to fund that bond reserve fund if it didn't otherwise get funded uh, through the initial flow. For the formation and operation of the uh, Stadium Authority itself and for stadium construction. Um, county turns around and issues bonds after certain things, many, a couple at least that Steve has referenced today. Those county bonds are then used to pay for the cost of issuing the bond itself, including the potential of capitalized interest. Again, if the bond reserve fund isn't funded, bond proceeds can be used to accomplish it and ultimately primarily for stadium construction. Additional public sources that are referenced earlier were the state transferable tax credits and the county development credit, which go to the benefit of the developer partner with the stadium. And that complicated picture is how a stadium gets built out of this flow of funds. Um, you know, order of magnitude, by the way, while this focuses on private funds, there's better than a billion and a quarter that comes from the team itself, um, the primary source of funding for the facility. After bonds, same setup, uh, goes to the county treasurer first for application of bond payment and reserve fund and then makes it to us. And so I'll bump this up to where the point it makes it to us because I need room at this point. Um, and 
what happens is it first pays for LBCBA administration in an amount not to exceed a million dollars a year. Goes to fund stadium operations, similar to football, if and only if uh, STADCO isn't otherwise running the stadium. Goes to, again, another point of funding for the debt reserve. This is what actually happened, this waterfall use in football post-COVID when the reserve needed to be reestablished. Re to repay the state credit enhancement if needed, if used. Um, that's a complicated conversation for another day, but the state provides a credit enhancement to accomplish a two times revenue coverage amount for the county bond deal. To repay reserve draws. And then at this point, and so all four of those are protection or sort of preventative type flows that in normal operations don't happen. And so in normal operations, what happens is bond payment, stadium administration, and then capital. And just kind of for a refresher, capital is that process we have gone through when Steve said on December 5th, we're going to talk about Allegiant Stadium. That specific reference is actually about that annual capital process where the Raiders present us with a capital plan. We evaluate it, we approve it, and then if the football water flows are adequate, we turn around and fund uh, those Stadka or Stadium Authority capital payments. At this point, this is where things get a little bit different and where the water, significantly different, and it's a waterfall step that doesn't exist in the football bill. At this point, revenue becomes available to repay the state transferable tax credits that are refundable and to go towards low income housing. And so, up to $100 million of transferable tax credits are part of the up to $380 million public financing package for the stadium. Transferable tax credits that are in excess of $60 million are refundable through this waterfall up to a maximum of $120 million of refundable credits. Up until the point that $45 million of these have been refunded, the available waterfall monies go 90% towards this refunding and 10% to Clark County for community low-income housing. That specific element not to exceed $5 million in any given year adjusted forward for CPI. After the point 45 million is paid, the split is 80-20 with those same annual caps. And then after this waterfall, if money makes it through this point of the waterfall, the next order of operation is up to $5 million per year directly additionally to low-income housing, also adjusted for CPI. Then the bottom of the waterfall is the same as the bottom of the football waterfall, money that gets to this point is available at this board's discretion to use for additional capital activities at the ballpark, to use for infrastructure adjacent to the ballpark, or for early repayment of the bonds. Um, realized that was a bit of a quick flip through, but it sets up agenda items two through seven. It sets up budgetary documents I'm going to bring to you in December and February, ultimately related to the monies when they start to come in in the spring and how we will treat initially the construction activities here. Um, my last point is, as this logo demonstrates, we're going to need a new logo in the not-too-distant future, and Steve and I have started talking about that. Uh, but otherwise, this, uh, this agenda item is informational, available if the board has any questions. Mr. Hill. Thank you, Mr. Finger. Uh, any questions? No question. Mr. Weekly. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Finger, um, in that diagram that you showed, um, you mentioned low-income housing. Who would that be through? Would that be through the county, or that is, that is directed through Clark County, and they administer that program? They would administer. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, um, I'm going to recommend that Mr. Finger deal with uh, agenda items two through seven uh, at the same time. Uh, we can, unless there is a concern about a particular fund that he talks about here, um, we can also. Um, vote on the entirety of those six items um, together. So, Mr. Finger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Agenda items two through seven are various resolutions to either create or rename funds of the Stadium Authority. The Stadium Authority is a local government created under Nevada state law and is required to follow generally accepted governmental accounting principles. And funds are a construct in governmental accounting. They're self-balancing sets of accounts that record financial activity for specific purposes. Start with our current organizational structure. The Stadium Authority Fund houses the room tax account that's required by the original SB1, and it accounts for the 0.88% room tax that paid for the bonds that went into Allegiant Stadium. 
football stadium bond payments. So all the money moves out of the stadium authority fund into each of the subsequent funds I show here. They move to the stadium authority debt service funds to pay for those bonds. They move to the UNLV contributions fund to make payments as we've done a couple of times in the last year to UNLV to make up for the SAM difference between football operating income and SAM Boyd versus the operating income over at Allegiant Stadium. They move to the capital projects fund again an activity we've been through a couple of times this year, and then money makes it to the bottom to this waterfall residual fund I just referenced. Baseball law created a similar framework. Agenda item two is going to ask the board to create the baseball stadium fund to house the baseball stadium tax account that is required by SB1, the second SB1, to receive SEID revenues after debt and bond reserve payments are made by the county treasurer. Agenda item four is going to ask the board to create the baseball debt service fund, which is not required by SB1, but is generally required by governmental gap and allowed by other states of other parts of state law. Agenda item three is going to ask the board to create the baseball stadium capital projects fund as required by SB1 to account for the public's portion of the stadium construction. The stadium authority's financial organization will look like this. It will have a set of baseball funds. It will have a set of football funds. The problem is when we created the football funds, we didn't know they were football funds. So we named them stadium authority funds. So we're going to ask you to rename the stadium authority fund the football stadium fund. We're going to ask you to rename the stadium authority debt service fund the football stadium debt service fund. Same treatment for the capital fund. Mr. Chair, that's my presentation on agenda items. Two through seven, staff recommends approval is available for any questions. Scintillating stuff. Um, any questions for Mr. Finger? Any concern about any individual fund? If not, I'd entertain a motion to approve agenda items two through seven. A motion, do we have a second? Second. Uh, please cast your vote. Lawrence Epstein, aye. McKinney James, aye. Those items pass. Um, send item eight, Mr. Finger. And so for the board and crowds entertainment, I'll tell you that I told the chair how long those two items were going to take this morning, and he told me I had 40% of that time to make that presentation. And I was in the ballpark of his 40% after it was done. No um, pun intended. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, our next several agenda items are the continuation of our process of key document development, working towards, as you mentioned earlier, an intended December 5th board approval date. For the lease, for the development agreement, and the non-relocation agreement, our goal, as Sandy referenced earlier, was to bring documents today in a substantially complete state for public review before that December 5th meeting. And those documents are in a very near to finished state at this point. Um, I won't re-reference your untenability comment. I will reference one other thing that we're going to add between here and there. For the December 5th meeting, when we asked this board to vote, unlike the document delivery that has occurred uh, heretofore, where we have generally presented these fairly concurrent with the time of the board meeting, we will post those five days ahead of time, make them available for board and public observation before we ask you to vote. So we'll start with the lease. Agenda item eight is the lease. It's the third time we bring it to you. The key provisions of the lease are the lease term, including extensions. They are, uh, the lease describes how the facility is allowed to be used. It requires Stadco to maintain and repair the facility and to make capital repairs and improvements. Uh, it defines Stadco's rights and obligations to stadium revenues, operations, and operational losses. It uh, requires a utilization and a maximization of the, of the stadium and the reporting to this board of such. That is actually what will happen in the last agenda item today in regard to Allegiant Stadium. Uh, it defines allowed changes and alterations to the stadium. It frames naming rights, parking requirements, the option provided in this law for the team to purchase the stadium at the end of any lease term and other rights and responsibilities of the party, as well as defaults and remedies that each party have. We've printed the lease for each of you present today. We've emailed it to board members attending virtually. We've posted it on the authority website under this link. And Mr. Chair, as we've done in the past, I'll present key changes to this lease since our last presentation in August. And I'll start with what's not in there in section 7.15 of the lease, much like your untenability comment. Uh, it's one of the two things we think we're gonna alter in this lease between here and 12.5. And we're working on a construct that provides for the parking obligations and rights of Stadco specifically, that they might be met by affiliates of Stadco and how that will work. 
we might actually deliver that at the October 31st meeting instead of the December 5th meeting. The baseball enabling law provides the Major League Baseball team an option to repurchase the stadium at the end of the initial lease term or any lease extension at a cost reasonably determined through a third party appraisal. To that end, language has been added in section 11.2b to describe various factors that will be considered as part of the appraisal of the fair market value of the stadium project if Stadco exercises this purchase option. The appraisal must value the real estate only, must take into consideration to the extent applicable, the benefits and burdens of the location, the adjacency to and co-location with the neighboring resort facility, the stadium project status as a special use project, or special use property, I should say, including the unique physical design and utility of its use, any known easements, reservations, restrictions, covenants, encumbrance declarations, and other words like that, um, but not the valuation of the team or STADCO, which aren't for sale. In the last lease iteration, and you referenced this earlier, Steve, we updated the language around extension terms, generally a core 30-year lease with 15-year uh, extensions available and a nine-year at the end, which create the potential for a 99-year lease. In this iteration, the lease adds details of team covenants necessary to maintain the lease after the expiration of the non-relocation agreement. And these include in 14.8B Romanet 1, that the team commits to playing Major League Baseball home games in the stadium and like in the non-relocation agreement in the first 30 years, the team's allowed to play up to seven games every two seasons at alternate sites with no more than four games played in any individual season. In 14.8B Romanet 2, consistent with the non-relocation agreement, the team may play postseason games at an alternate site, if so required by MLB for substantially all MLB teams. In section 14.8C, which also follows the non-relocation agreement, it describes stadium untenability conditions and then requires that the team use commercially reasonable, diligent, and good faith efforts to attempt to minimize and overcome any such untenantability situations and attempt to play games in any such period in Clark County. Section 14.8D provides that canceled home games because of a Major League Baseball work stoppage are not a breach of these covenants, requires any games played by replacement players to be played at the stadium. And Section 14.E importantly allows Stadco to request a renegotiation of these terms after 30 years. The parties have agreed to renegotiate these terms subject to the board's approval, of course, in good faith in the future to bring the terms into conformity with then prevailing practices in MLB venues who have also received public funding. So what that really means is the effort that brought us to the seven slash four construct here was a whole lot of work looking at the state of baseball and the state of other non-relocation agreements. And we've afforded the opportunity for a good faith negotiation for that three decades from now in the future. Yeah, and I mean, in, just to put a point on um, where we are here, um, and you've said this, but I want to repeat it because I think it's worth repeating. Um, the non-relocation agreement that will be discussed shortly applies to the first 30 years. Um, and as I talked about at our last meeting, we view uh, what happens in the first 30 years differently than we review, uh, than we view what happens after that 30-year period. Um, but um, much of what is um, in this covenant to play that is, was originally in the non-relocation agreement also needs uh, to be in the lease for the period of time after 30 years. So what Mr. Finger is talking about here is what happens after 30 years uh, and is in the lease. What happens in the first 30 years is in the non-relocation agreement. Grazie. And so to that end, all of those uh, covenants that I just described have a companion in 15.1 that provides in 15.1, 15.2, that failure to meet these covenants to play baseball in the stadium um, is a default event and ultimately, you know, subject to our discretion and subject to other terms can become a terminable terminable event of a fault. Um, there are notifications and responses required in a construct there to make sure that uh, that doesn't happen unnecessarily. Language has been added to section 17.1B Romanet 3 setting forth certain required terms for the team use agreement. Addressing the team's responsibility for paying operating and maintenance costs incurred because of team events in the stadium. So the team use agreement kicks in in the event that Stadco defaults in the lease and 
is kicked out of the lease and the stadium authority takes over the operation of the facility. And this construct requires that the assumption of that team use agreement between STADCO and the team is one where the team pays for the reasonable cost and maintenance of the facility so that we're handed a reasonable document at that point. Um, Language has been added to section 19.24B to prevent MLB rules from overriding all of those section 14.8 covenants that I referred to earlier. And again, that's during renewal terms. And the definition of untenantability period has been expanded to provide for the need for emergency repairs to be undertaken. And I won't restate what Steve said earlier about what we're considering in terms of expanding the untenantability situation to allow for significant renovation. Um, Mr. Chair, I went fairly quickly through that. There was actually, I mean, a fair amount of content, a fair amount of work that went into that, but that's the end of the changes to the lease. And as I said earlier, with the exception of the untenantability and the parking situation, we feel like this document's pretty close to being done and ready for the December 5th vote. Um, Mr. Mark Arnold and uh, Brian and Caroline and I are all available if staff has or if board has any questions on this item. Thank you, Mr. Finger. Uh, any questions from the board? Okay. Agenda item nine. Yep. All right. Agenda item nine is the updated development agreement. It was last presented at the July 18th board meeting. The development agreement is a relatively simple document conceptually, but is easily the most complicated document to read and in terms of understanding the writing of the four foundational documents. It provides the financing and construction framework for the baseball stadium. It's complicated in its construct mainly because of the words necessary to describe the process of shared construction funding between the private and public funds. The development agreement requires the stadium to be consistent with first class premier MLB facilities currently in operation or approved for construction. It requires to be the ballpark at that site that just went through the demolition. It requires an enclosed baseball stadium with a capacity of approximately 30,000 folks. It prescribes the sources of financing to pay for the stadium and it requires that the first $100 million of the project is paid by the team that the last $50 million is paid by the public, and all the amounts paid in between are paid pro rata, um, except this one's a, more different. Uh, it's, it's, it's different and it's significantly more complicated than the Raiders one where essentially all the money was up front because the bonds come in probably at the beginning of construction, but potentially later than the beginning of construction. But those temporary or those transferable tax credits I referred to earlier come in in staggered amounts. Um, and come in in no more than $36 million a year increments. So it requires a constant recalculation of share. And what it generally requires and demands then is that uh, the team is constantly paying ahead of what its final pro rata share will be at the end and that the public's pro rata payment lags. The same document requires the developer partner, talking about our meetings next year, to show up and provide periodic progress reports to this board on the status of development and construction contains provisions regarding prevailing wage and small business participation, uh, requires the partner to provide all adjacent infrastructure the state and the county requires, and it requires the developer partner to take into consideration the use of multimodal facilities that use alternate means of transportation. So there are a lot of words that are changed in this document. I told you it's a sizable document. A number of them, I'm not going to cover all of them. A number of them are minor technical corrections that have been made to the document without changing its intent since the last time. The work of attorneys word fighting. The document was also the fourth of the four documents to go through the negotiation process. So changes have been made to catch it up to what we ended up deciding to do with the lease. And I'll refer to a couple of those. So the changes that are noteworthy that are worth bringing out here, that we made clarifying edits throughout section 3.4 to better describe the mechanics relating to the issuance of those transferable tax credits and then the related pro rata funding calculations. We added language in section 3.9, I'm sorry, to describe the process for STADCO to demonstrate to the authority that STADCO has made the required initial STADCO contribution as well as any additional initial contributions. Language has been added to section 5.2 to provide for a form of deed for the land dedication to be appended to the development agreement. Uh, this is the deed that it will show up at the October 31st meeting. A new section 5.3 has been added to provide that concurrently with the dedication of the land, 
the authority Stadco and the owner of the benefited parcel will enter into a reciprocal easement agreement and that the form of such agreement must be acceptable to those parties. Article 19 dispute resolution has been updated to align with the lease to come to the conclusions we came to in the lease negotiation. Per request for Major League Baseball language has been added to Section 21.3 to make clear the development agreement may only be amended upon the receipt of all necessary MLB approvals. This change is consistent with the terms of the lease as well. And the definition of force majeure has been revised to align with the terms of the lease. And finally, the definitions of infrastructure improvements and infrastructure work in the definition section have been revised to cross-reference the off-site infrastructure agreement which is a separate agreement that will address required infrastructure improvements off of the project site. So Mr. Chair, this is also an informational item. It doesn't require board action. It will show up on December 5th with the other foundational documents for board approval. Any questions for Mr. Finger? Okay, thanks very much. Uh, agenda item 10. Agenda item 10 is the shortest of the documents. It's the non-relocation agreement. It too is brought to the board for the third time, the last time being July 18th. A non-relocation agreement is a standard document for stadiums that receive public funding. It's the document that marries the public investment to a length of stay requirement for the professional team with a penalty imposed if the length of stay requirement isn't met, which is ultimately the requirement under Senate Bill 1 that the team pay for outstanding public financing if they leave. It requires the baseball team to stay in Vegas for not less than 30 years. It includes the framework of how many games the team is allowed to play at neutral sites, what happens if the stadium becomes untenantable. It provides for force majeure events and other specific situational requirements. The document has just a couple of changes that are worth noting since the last presentation, and they are that in Section 4, language has been added to clarify that the team is only relieved of its obligations under the agreement if the lease is terminated and the authority rejects a team use agreement that includes the terms specified in the lease. So what that means is when I was back in the lease and I said that the team use agreement had to pay for the cost of team operations, including maintenance, um, that is tied to this and said that as long as um, we're, they're only relieved of their non-relocation obligations if we reject a team use agreement that doesn't conform to what that lease demands of it and the conformance is the payment of those costs. This language is intended to ensure that the NRA and the lease work together. In section 619, language has been added, 6.19, language has been added to align with the MLB homes game require, home games requirement, meaning that there is both a single season and a two season measurement, four games and seven games, and we needed to add that sentence to say it measures in both one year and two years um, to, to apply you know, sort of breach and covenant response. And maybe I lied and maybe there were three things I was going to tell you about. The last is that in the force majeure definition, uh, we added some language to provide that disputes relating to force majeure and untenantability will be resolved through ADR. It actually doesn't live in the force majeure section, but it refers to force majeure and untenantability. So not much change there. This document, I think, is done and will be available for uh, be asked to be voted on December 5th. No action required today, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Finger. Any questions uh, for Mr. Finger? Uh, which is not particularly surprising given that you just got 250 pages of documentation. And so not having the questions here today um, is, is not uh, surprising. Um, the purpose of getting all of this today, though, is to give you an opportunity to review them uh, to have the others review them um, for the next seven weeks uh, for us to receive any input that you have, that members of the public have, um, and that's why all of this documentation is intended to be as close to done today as we can um, so that um, everybody that um, is interested in this has the opportunity uh, to review it and provide input between now and when it might be approved. So. Um, and I want to echo what Sandy said um, on both sides of the table. You recognized everybody on our side, Sandy, but um, um, the A's and your team have worked diligently. These are not particularly easy documents or easy topics. Uh, and uh, I want to thank 
everybody from the A's and the A's team for all the work that's gone into this uh, up to this point. Uh, and I want to reiterate uh, the thanks on our side as well, um, you know, Mark and Ryan, and particularly Caroline and Ed for um, all that you have done. We uh, kind of dropped this on you a year ago in addition to all the other work that you have to do. Uh, you've done a fantastic job. We really appreciate it. I really appreciate it. So thank you. Um, if I said it was my pleasure or our pleasure, Caroline would hit me, so I'm not going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, despite that, uh, <laughs> it's gone well, but so thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, we will uh, turn to agenda item 12 then. Mr. Chair, agenda item 12 asks the board to approve the non conference home football schedule for UNLV for 20, the period 20, 30, 25 to 2032. The agenda item describes the lease. It describes the joint use agreement framework for UNLV's use of Allegiant. Generally, in addition to allowed conference games, which this board voted on last board meeting, UNLV has the right to schedule two Saturday non-conference home games each season, subject to a priority order that prioritizes NFL events. The attached proposed schedule includes six dates previously approved by the board and five new dates. These dates have been agreed to by the readers, not the readers, the Raiders. As is normal, UNOV still has slots in the outer years uh, that they're working on, and these will get filled in over time. Um, Mr. Chair, agenda item 12 is an action item, and staff recommends approval. Any questions uh, for Mr. Finger? Mr. Weekly? Yes, um, I'd like to maybe see Syracuse put back on here, please. <laughs> I saw Mr. Newcomb nod. <laughs> so. Anybody else? Okay, do, uh, do I have a motion to approve? We have a motion and a second. Please cast your votes. Lawrence Epstein, aye. Rose McKinney, James, aye. And that passes. Thank you. I would, uh, before we move on to agenda item 13, just want to congratulate uh, UNLV on the start to the year. Uh, it's uh, pretty exciting. And uh, uh, we hope that uh, some of the work of this board has led to some of that success over the past number of years. So uh, we'll, we're going to take a little credit for that along the way. <laughs> but uh, Coach Odom probably uh, deserves a little more than this board does. So, um, yep, absolutely. Um, okay, agenda item 13. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I talked earlier about the lease of this requirement for maximization of the facility and the Raiders lease for Allegiant uh, demands the same thing. And so as part of that, there's a reporting requirement. And as you used to see, and uh, folks are here today to report on, in this case, how quarter three of calendar 2024 went. And it is either going to be Mr. Feldman or Mr. Crum that gives that presentation. Thank you, Mr. Finger. It will be Mr. Feldman today. And I'll congratulate Mike also on the start to the UNLV season. It's been fun to watch. Uh, good quarter three for us at Allegiant Stadium. Um, I'll run through a few of the highlights and then take any questions anyone has. Uh, since opening, we've now hosted over 600 ticketed and private events at the stadium, so we surpassed a big number there in quarter three, and now we are over 5 million guests hosted in the building. Uh, we had 13 ticketed events in quarter three and 20 private events. Those ticketed events were highlighted by the Copa quarterfinal match between Brazil and Uruguay. Uh, our two first open stadium practices to the public to start the Raiders season. We averaged around 20,000 guests at both of those events and were able to bring a lot of people who hadn't been inside the stadium there before inside to see them practice. Uh, the beginning of the UNLV and Raiders football seasons obviously started in quarter three. We hosted an incredible football game between USC and LSU for the Vegas kickoff classic. We hosted very successful back-to-back -back Morgan Wallen concerts in August, and then we welcomed back Pink for the second time in the stadium to host her concert. Take any questions anybody has. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Feldman. Uh, big quarter. Congratulations. Keep it up. Thanks. <laughs> what have you done for us lately? Yeah. <laughs> we just did it. We just announced two nights of cold play for you. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. Thank you. And uh, any questions for Mr. Feldman? Okay.
is for any matter within the jurisdiction of the board, um, please identify yourself and uh, limit your comments to three minutes. Welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Hill. And for the record, Jeremy Koo, J-E-R-E-M-Y-K-O-O. -O. Um, it's not strictly within the jurisdiction of the board, but it's really just a personal note. Um, I don't begrudge Las Vegas obtaining a Major League Baseball team. Uh, Oakland and the East Bay lost a community institution, but that community remains. And I was among the 46,889 at the Oakland Coliseum a few weeks ago that cried at the last national anthem, the last ceremonial first pitch, the last seventh inning stretch, and all too soon the final out. I can't speak for all Oakland A's fans, but my hope is that this community, sometimes called a community of transients, em embraces this historic and transient baseball team. I hope that you honor the histories of the communities that they left behind, Oakland, Kansas City, Philadelphia, by showing up as this city does for the Golden Knights to, and, and cheer on these Las Vegas A's. My doubts about Mr. Fisher's ability to treat this team as a civic institution does not interfere with my desire to see my neighbors experience the same joys and sorrows that I experienced as a fan of the 1990s and through, through this year's athletics. It's a heck of a ride, and I hope you all get your money's worth. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome to come. Good afternoon. Chair Hill, Chris Daly, Nevada State Education Association and Schools Over Stadiums. First, Schools Over Stadiums has never been under the illusion uh, that this board would take to heart the concerns of everyday people. We know you largely serve as a rubber stamp for the big resorts, gaming, development interests, and now the A's, fine. Over much of the last year, we've been battling lawyers for John Fisher and this authority. While we've had a couple of setbacks in courts of law, we are overwhelmingly winning the battle in the court of public opinion. Everyday Nevadans not only share our priorities, they are also aware that John Fisher is the worst owner in sports. Simply put, the public is against this deal. I think that's probably why there's been a lot of posturing uh, it happens on that side of the dais. I think it happens on this side of the dais as well over the viability of the A stadium proposal and will it actually happen? Last week, uh, Chair Hill mentioned that he peeked at the Fisher's books and found they're still billionaires. Not a point that we've ever debated. Don Fisher certainly made billions of dollars with the gap. What, I, what is up for the debate is the character of his son. Will John Fisher balk on this Las Vegas deal like he's balked on many time and time again? Or has the cheapest owner in sports convinced his brothers to invest hundreds of millions of dollars of their own resources to make this deal happen? Before the beginning of this meeting, I thought we'd have an answer in December. But Chair Hill said that the positive funds or binding letter of credit wouldn't be required before you sign a development agreement. It would only be required right before the issuance of bonds. That means we won't really know for sure. The public won't really know for sure if the Fishers are real and truly committed to putting their resources into this project until 2025 or even later. Speculation about this project's viability won't be answered this year. What we do know is schools over stadiums is still here and we will continue to question Nevada subsidizing a billionaire while not adequately funding schools for kids. And if the Fishers choose to spend their own money and move this project forward 2025 or 2026 or later, we will still be here. We will be fighting, taking it to the streets uh, where we will win in the court of public opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Good afternoon. Hello, thank you for let me be here, and for the record, my name is Evelyn Pacheco. I am an Army veteran. I am also a retiree of the Plumbers and Pipefitters Union. I am also the first black woman to get a plumber's license in the state of Nevada in 2007. I am now the president of Nevada Women in Trades, where we successfully help women 
get careers in high-skilled blue-collar trades. We have a curriculum. We have graduated women into five different unions and also CDLs, also Culinary Academy, and that's what we're doing here. But my question is, and I have already emailed Mr. Fingers, my question is, for the workforce, what are going to be either the percentages or the hours for women, women of color, and veterans on this job? And I know today that's not what you talked about, but I would like for Nevada Women in Trades to be on the email list for when you do decide to talk about this and be at the table, because I think this is very important that we move the needle to make sure the underserved, underemployed women in this city can have a fair chance to make a fair living, to be able to buy a house, to be able to have a car, and to be able to take care of their kids. Thank you. No answer? No, we're not allowed to have a dialogue with you during public comment. But, but can I get on the email list yeah, so no, when I, that does absolutely, happen? Absolutely. That, that's what I wanted. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Anybody else? Okay, uh, thanks everybody uh, for this afternoon. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.